Deb Willis is a professor and chair of the Department of Photography and Imaging at the Tisch School of the Arts at NYU. An exhibition version of Posing Beauty has been touring the United States since 2009, making stops at the Northwest Ameri African American Museum in Seattle, the David D. C. Driscoll Center in College Park, Maryland, and the USC Fisher Museum in, of Art in Los Angeles. In 2013, she convened the first Black Portraitures Conference in Paris. In October, the fifth iteration of this internationally recognized phenomenon brought together a number of well-known figures, including art historian Kelly Jones and, cho and choreographer uh, Ronald K. Brown. Willis has not only made archives and scholarship accessible, she's also created an appetite for learning and sharing knowledge. Anchoring her work is her belief in the beauty of the black image and its power to sustain family, build community, build community dictate style, rethink representation, and change perceptions. Everyone, please welcome me, and uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Deborah Willis. Thank you. This was a wonderful introduction and wonderful to see all of you here. I want to take a photograph of all of you. <laughs> to remember these moments. You know, this is um, really important because Oakland is in San Francisco area and then I see my dear friends, Louis and Nashime and family members, David. And I, it's just so great to see all of you here. Um, I'm not gonna name everyone, but it's, it's really special. It's special because I um, spent time with um, Chris Johnson when my son was looking for grad school, and deciding to go to CCA was, was a really important moment for all of us because in terms of transforming ideas and rethinking about images was central. So I wanna start off by thanking Moad and the, and the team here to embrace my work, but also to think about the stories behind photographs. One of the most important aspects for me was to think about the notion of the griot. And I'm gonna read a quote by Charles Bloxon. He says, in Africa, each family has a griot or an archivist who committed to the family photograph. Each griot was a pr is in preparation for death, would hand over his entire log of historical stories to a younger man who becomes the new family historian. In this way, a family could always trace its history back hundreds of years. The photograph for me has always been a signifier for storytelling and reimagining events from personal memories, from other experiences that were created by professional photographers or family members. In my view, images of family life and, and events in the photographic album has shaped and narrated many histories and voices of the family. To merge that story, I wanted to con con kind of combine images of collective memory to think about the graphic stories, but also to share some of my own photographs when I was a young child, Christmas, thinking about how to tell a story about Christmas um, and looking at my own first camera that my father gave me and the black doll. What was important for me was that search of looking for identity, but I was curious when it started. Here we see my doll, Susie, we see the TV, you know, we have this ubiquitous photograph in all of our families with gifts and with the tree as well as the cards. In those moments, I also looked at my father's photographs of his family. Uh, here I am with my mother looking adoringly at me and my sister um, who I dedicate this talk to who I lost last year. And, and our babysitter. So here we see it, we're in the kitchen table, but also to think about this image here where my father is, was a policeman, he had a grocery store, but he also was a paper hanger. So he you know, um, designed houses in, in North Philly and West Philly and South Philly, but we thought he was taking our photograph for us, but he was showing his artwork. <laughs> he was showing his skill. And so I really love this image because I'm holding my black doll, Yvonne's holding her white doll, and we're just posing, thinking daddy is celebrating us and he's celebrating his handicraft. <laughs> but looking at that history, I wanted to think about the images of 
black dolls and the central story that always shaped this experience in, in family histories. That um, what it meant, this is the Nashville Globe, and it says when you see a Negro doll, it means a lot in terms of race pride as, as opposed to racial suicide. So here we begin to think about how black doll companies were developed, and I'm hoping that you can see with this wonderful um, images, but I found in the archives um, children in the 19 teens holding dolls, but then also we also see this image of a black photographer who's hired by this family to photograph in their home. And what's so wonderful in discovering this image, we see the child with the white doll, we see the family, we see the wallpaper like my dad's. We also see artwork on the wall, photographs on the wall, and that this, the father is holding out an, a message. Can't read it, but he's sending a message in that image. But in that image also, in the mirror, we see the reflection of a black photographer. So we see how central it was for black families to have their photographs made in introducing that. And also that Marcus Garvey, um, he also had a doll factory. And it was organized and, and, and displayed um, in Harlem and in other places, and advertised again in, in black newspapers. And we began to see the importance of racial pride in, during that time. So here are some of the images. We see a, a black child with a white doll and a white child with a black doll. In that same period in the 50s, we, on family vacations, we pose in front of um, you know, here we are at, at, at Gettysburg and thinking about going to different places and, and looking at um, history, thinking about the building of America. And then also my mom had a beauty shop and growing up in a beauty shop was about storytelling. And storytelling is, is central to my own understanding of what it means to be black and being a female. And wonder, one of the <laughs> important aspects I wanted to document is here's my mom seated in her colleague who she went to beauty school with, and here in the phone booths. Um, there's like, limit your calls to three minutes. There are rules in the beauty shop. You know, they're, they're, there's etiquette in the beauty shop. There's also ways of, you know, nurturing um, mothers who are having problems, children, and, and the whole experience. So we begin to see the central way of looking at the beauty shop. Also, as, in terms of celebrating growth here, um, you'll see, again, my father's wallpaper, I'm on the phone, but my mother's uh, diploma from the Apex Beauty School, how central that meant was for her to display that. Here, in, and I photographed in North Carolina and in, in Durham and started photographing in beauty shops in the early 2000s, and just following the same, please do not sit you know, on this table, you know, yes, we accept tips, so there are all these rules that are going on there. The other aspect is um, quilting. I grew up in a family of quilters, and my father was a tailor, as I mentioned. And here is this piece called Daddy's Ties, and creating this image was basically honoring um, the loss, uh, the memory of my father in terms of his, his um, death, but also thinking about his activities in communities. And we see his ties to communities and art, but also other ways of exploring his experience. I also photographed in 1980 um, in, in New York, and I was really interested in, as I mentioned, storytelling and, and the, the healing in, in black communities. I, I love the way readers are a central way for um, people in, in black communities to think about the future. There's always a way of thinking about the future, always a way of asking questions and looking for ways to tell stories. And here, a woman is reading the cards. When I was in school, I was told um, that um, I was taking up a good man's space and that all I was going to do when I graduated was get pregnant, have a baby, and a good man could have been in, in that space. And so when I'm sitting in a room of 18 men and two other women, um, one black, one white, and we were silenced by our desire to um, make art, to, to contribute to society, and so we were really concerned. This image, this image is a part of that history, because um, I, I of course got pregnant after I graduated, and but this teacher really wanted to silence me, and as a result of that, um, I decided to when I when I got pregnant, I made photographs about my body, 
And then I put the images away, and my son found it, uh, this about eight years ago, the contact sheet, and said, Mom, you've never printed these images. And I, and I told him the story. And then we decided, uh, we worked with Brandy Wine Workshop and created this piece, and this piece is called A Good Man. And it says, uh, a, a woman taking up a space from a good man, and then the accusation, you took up space from a good man. And then I said, I made space for a good man. So here, here that kind of balances out that experience. And following that, we have, my mother was a mother at 28 with me, and I was a mother um, at, with Hank at 28. So we found images in making these stories. So this is, sometimes I see myself in you, this is a reflection of that experience. So just giving you that family background, I wanted to kind of introduce how uh, family photographs were central into my own academic work, my own artistic work. Morgan and Marvin Smith were crucial to my early um, studies in photography. And here, their twin brothers, photographers in Harlem, in, uh, had a studio at the Apollo Theater, uh, above the Apollo Theater, and they're posing um, one of their models. And I wanted to move to the next, and it is a... My brother and I okay. were striving all the time to present the community in, in, a, in a good light. They had a conscious effort of showing the, the positive aspects of it. To show some of the activity that included the normalcy of, of, of the Harlem life, not necessarily... Just the other day. I just want to show this clip. It's just a beautiful way of how these photographers embraced and celebrated beauty. about Morgan and Marvin Smith and then going through the histories of images um, through the 19th century, looking at um, Frederick Douglass as a central figure. And he th saw photography as a crucial way of looking at biography. And he photographed there over 270 photographs of, of, of Frederick Douglass. He visited the photographic studio in every city he traveled, where he lived. He understood what it meant to present himself in an, in an imposing image as a free man, what it meant to be photographed. A contemporary photographer, Omar Victor Diop, who lives in, in Paris and also in, in West Africa, also decided to follow this kind of tradition of looking through histories and seeing how black men traveled in the 19th century. He would dress as these subjects, 
studying this experience, dressed as these subjects, and you can see how he's using the same style, finding the tailor, finding a wig to create the new look. But in the 19th century, and as he says in the 21st century, black men traveled in sports, as political leaders, as activists. And here he uses the soccer uh, whistle as a signifier in looking at um, Frederick Douglass's image. Other images I thought was really central for me was um, Frederick Douglass's son, Louis Douglass, who fought in the Civil War, who was wounded in, um, in the Civil War in South Carolina. He wrote letters to his loved one, Helen Amelia Logan, um, about the experiences of the war, that their hope for the future. And here they exchanged photographs during the war. So we began to think about how black soldiers saw their futures, um, their future wives posing, um, and how they exchanged photographs. When they visited the studio, the photographer helped in, uh, embellish the image with gold leaf. We know that um, many soldiers were photographed for their um, lieutenants, and here it says, Emmett Adams reads well, makes the morning reports, um, is the company, um, does is good conduct, and has won the esteem of the officer. So we see him proud, um, image, pose, leg cross, and then you see this man, James Roberts, who was a free man when he entered the war, and now he's hard to manage, is now a bass uh, drummer, stubborn and reckless. So we begin to see what this man felt when he entered the war. He had a sense of hope, but then again, look at his jacket, it's open, legs not crossed, and so this sense of finding identity, his hat tilted, so he's creating a new identity in, in terms of new masculinity. During and after slavery, this is a woman who was an enslaved woman who has an eight by 10 tintype. And we see how important it is because she felt necessary that the photographer also hand tinted her dress. So we begin to see identities form. Mothers with their children, free women f posing. But then also in the 19 teens, we see um, activists, Nanny Helen Burroughs holding a banner leading women um, for women's conferences and, and conventions. We see also the activity you know, of Ida B. Wells and that experience of Ida B. Wells and going to a, a woman photographer to be photographed. What it meant for the 19th Amendment and black women and the idea, this is the year, this is the 100th year, celebrating. Here we see a headquarters for colored women voters. We don't know these stories, but we know them because the photographs are evidence of the experience of these women. Look at their shoes, you look at their hats, their determination, their banners, their sense of pride. We also know that the photographic album was a central meaning and, and feeling for, for black people, specifically when we think about how the Bible was also a central reader for black people. So we see this leather bound, we see the gold leaf, we also see images such as always thinking of you. How do we see these images? We know that they circulated in postcards, and here's uh, a postcard collection at Hopkins, John Hopkins University. It's a fantastic way, I love this, this young woman, she says, hello dear Maggie, Hello, Maggie, dear. How are you, doll? I'm going to see you one day, Saturday, before long. Here is one of my photographs. I see you laughing now. Love to all. But you see, these are like self-conscious images of young girls relating to each other, relating to the photograph. They're sharing. Women are traveling, teaching in black colleges, going to school, having a hope, a sense of hope. We see that women were looking for entertainment, working in the entertainment industry, industry you know, and um, th the aspect of dressing and, and new identities, and, and, and there's a new term now that, um, is Tyler here? Because I, is Tyler here? Tyler, when I said cross-dressing and you said what? Oh, uh, <laughs> I think that's the nature of what the Right, so I said this was a cross-dresser and he corrected me in terms of the 21st century way of understanding, and I think it's really important to think about how do we think about dressing and, and performance during that time period. But these are black men and women who, who have, were determined to express their, their creativity. Harlem, a central place, as we see walking through the streets of Harlem, girls, central ways of looking at each other, fur coats, laughter, mothers with, with their children, um, men with their hats, and moving through Harlem, um, Henry um, Cartier-Bresson was an important photographer. He created the term 
the decisive moment. Here is Easter Sunday. We see what it means to have a decisive moment. We see the experience. Are we cool with um, time? Okay. With uh, here, he is this axis of looking back and looking forward. We see um, images by Van der Zee. Van der Zee holding a newspaper where it's describing black soldiers in World War I, and then also couples going into the studio. We see the importance of, of Harlem. We see the importance of a black photographer photographing black subjects by a white photographer. We see this experience of Josephine Baker as a model in cigarette cards. Here she is um, advertising. So when men smoke, women smoked at the same time as well. But these were geared for men to consume women. As they smoked, they could imagine these women in their houses, in their spaces. So these are images that circulated. And then thinking about the hairstyles, how the hairstyles change and transform. This is Florence Mills. This is the year that King Tut's tomb was open, and they created styles called the Tut Cut, based on that experience, because black hairdressers and black journalists visited King Tut's tomb. So we begin to see mobilization and globalization in a different way. We see here uh, Madam C.J. Walker with her car and her women. We see Josephine Baker selling the Baker look, the Baker fix. We also know that these fast photographs and how girlfriends had spent time in the studio. We see couples um, posing. We see men sending a message through a pose, like here this dapper with his cane and then man with flowers. And this is one of my favorites of this man, Reginald Smith, for you darling, quietly posing and sending this postcard. Um, we also see couples moving from the south, still wearing a, a zoot suit, coming north, and what that meant um, with this white picket fence. This is um, a minister who um, was in uh, Oklahoma, and he had a camera, and he just set it on the street, and no sound, but he documented um, black communities in Oklahoma and in the Midwest. And so here we begin to see here is a Mason's Parade. So we see the breadth and depth of these communities. We, Solomon Jones was his name. And here, um, Carl Van Vechten photographing Billie Holiday. Um, color images, um, James Baldwin, and also Zora Neale Hurston. When she sees photographs, she says, I like the one when I'm looking mean and impressive. <laughs> so we begin to see how images talk back. We see that Gordon Park says that I saw the camera as a weapon um, in terms of a choice of weapon to expose um, injustices. And we see here a Sunday afternoon, a theater colored entrance sign, but Gordon is, w and the way that he photographs, he finds the beauty and we see the red and the signifiers as he poses. How children are looking outside, inside and outside, outside of the experience of play. We see how these images were used in the magazine, in Life magazine. These images are central. And here, um, Gordon Parks was a mag, he worked for the magazine, um, this magazine called Smart Woman Magazine. I, I think it's really important to think about magazines and titles of magazines during this time period. This is um, geared to a black audience. Here is Smart Woman. And this is his wife, his first wife, who was also a hat designer. And here we see her posing, Christmas issue. And Gordon in Washington, he's photographing Duke Ellington. And Marva Lewis. And of course, we see again, Eartha Kitt. Here he is in Paris with his family. Um, who photographed this? He, how did he know that this was an important image? To document his life as his family moves to Paris on the Central Avenue in Paris. And he photographed uh, Muhammad Ali, and also looking again about fashion and the experience of, of entertainers and how they represent as they travel the world. Here's Billie Holiday with African mask earrings. Um, another photographer, Eve Arnold, who photographed for Magnum magazine, uh, Magnum, Magnum photographs, photographed in, in Harlem. This is at the Abyssinian Baptist Church. And this is fashion show, and this is a a model who is known as fabulous, you know, and I love the known nation, notion of self-naming 
when we think about this experience. And here she is, uh, Charlotte Stribling, and as she poses um, and for the Harlem community. And also the style and, and, and music. We see this hat, this pork pie hat, and how people wanted to create and have this style. And so there's um, designers and, and, and ways to look at it. And here's the ad in the paper. So here we begin to see how to make a pork pie so you can look cool too. <laughs> so we see these images and it's really central. And here's Miles Davis's closet by Anthony Barboza posing full of these images and moving forward. And so again, Barboza. Danielle Luna by Abaddon. And in terms of magazines, we know black models on the cover of magazines. We have Ebony, we have Jet, we have Tan and Hue. But thinking about the experience of color, color was a signifier and was really important for people to celebrate blackness in a broader way. Um, there was a Miss Fine Brown Frame contest. Um, black photographers created that. And it's really amazing to think about the idea of a black brown frame. And then the arrest of, of Dr. Martin Luther King, again, in terms of fashion, when dressed for respectability, um, here he is arrested, hat still on his head. You know, important. The image of where black protesters dressed a certain way, hoping that, that these um, policemen would see them as human. Um, but here we see this experience. Hank Willis Thomas um, made a photograph, looked at this photograph and made a 3D image of the experience. And here he is, what it meant to create a, a sculpture. And he calls this punctum, just the idea of what it meant for to create this uh, man's clothes being torn off by the dogs and here pulling this experience. Again, Bruce Davidson, pearl earrings. We see this sense of drama and, and, and t um, this aspect of her arm. You can look at her arm. You can see the strength, the twist of her arm as she's being arrested. But she got dressed to fight for voting, fight for all of these experiences. And then we see in the background, he said that he didn't see suspense, excitement, you know, backstreet, damn the defiant. All of that in terms of how do we think about how images can retell a story when looking through the foreground and the background. Beauty contests in churches, um, Jack, Frank, Jack Franklin and John Mosley, self-portraits of photographers um, during this time period. Leonard Freed photographing in Harlem fashion shows. So we begin to see the importance of Dr. King in all of these communities. They're not looking at his face, they're looking at his hands. They wanna touch his hand, they want that strength and we see it in a sense of pride. We see him again. We rarely see him in terms of this experience of pleasure and leisure. Um, a woman, he's in Atlantic City at Chicken Bone Beach. And here we see him posing. And a young woman is photographing, kneeling as she's making this image of him. Again, Harlem, central way of looking at how families are moving through Harlem. Um, March on Washington, Leonard Freed. These images are all circulating sense of pride, sense of community with Fannie Lou Hamer, um, the experience of Lou Draper. I also, again, as I mentioned, photographing in the beauty shop, continuing and to move forward to see these images of a, a contemporary photographer, Sunil Gupta, who's photographing today. And then what it meant for a model to see her her image in this show, and I wanted to capture that moment. How many minutes? Are One? Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to end this with um, Bayate Ross Smith as he's um, created this piece called My Kind of People. And here um, he's asking different people to pose for him. And what do you see when you read a per when you see a person with a hoodie, with curly hair, with a cap, or with a, with a ha um, hair just naturally styled? and what assumptions are being made in these images. So I wanted to end with um, that image. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.
So we have um, a few moments for Q&A. What, five minutes or so? Yes. Thank you, yes. Um, my father um, was my cousin Dave's uh, brother. M my father had his little sister move into our house when we were kids, and he photographed everybody. Um, and they were all storytellers. Um, they love sharing moments of, of beauty in, in the family. And one of the aspects for me in growing up uh, with my father who had a, a Roloflex camera who really loved photography, um, giving me a camera, like a brownie, so that we could document. I had no idea that I would ever become a photographer, but I knew I wanted to. But he wanted me to be secretary for Goldie Watson. Do you remember Goldie Watson when you were right <laughs> in Philadelphia? She worked at City Hall, and that was the biggest job that a black woman could have in Philadelphia. And so he wanted to make sure that I had a position, that I would have a job, but then I knew I wanted to go to art school, which was across the street from the, from the business school that I attended as well. So that experience for me, and he encouraged me throughout my life, and he was at every exhibition that I had or every talk that I organized, and it was really a wonderful experience to have that. Thank you for asking that question. One more? Two more, okay. There was one in the back. Hello. Can you say your name as well? Oh, Jan, please. We can hear you. I'm not defining beauty, I'm exposing it, okay? So it's a different experience. So I don't define beauty, I want you to experience it when you see it. That was a deep fit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there is a lady here and then, and then Tracy, you ask. Oh, thank you. I wanted to ask you, um, what does it mean for you to be a good storyteller? And also, um, in your, in the, um, in the, um, what you just presented, like I saw themes of hope and freedom. And right now, like living in a time where there's a, a, a very, there's a loss of hope. Like how would you, um, like what is your advice or like what is your recommendations for continuing that? Right, <laughs> yeah, well, that's, thank you for your, your words, but it's really fascinating to think about all of us are storytellers and we have hopeful stories to tell. There was a young woman at another talk that I had and she said, oh, your generation, you're always thinking about hope, you know, and, I, and I'm like saying if we don't have hope, we don't have a future. And so, I mean, she was really dogging me about, you know, this, and then I had to end up coming up with a Deb Willis question, answer. Like, I said, I have Obama hope. So in thinking about Obama hope, um, who would imagine that Obama would have moved as fast in terms of becoming president? So I believe that with creating, like I curated a show called um, Migrations and Meaning and Art, I want, it, I want people to believe that when they move through different parts of their lives, that they're moving for, um, for a future. And future is that sense of when we think about the Black Panther movie, we think about a whole aspect of futurism, it has to be that black people will survive. 
And how do we survive? We survive by telling stories that are broader than the stories that are told to us, that are presented to us. Look, look this image here by Kwame Brathwaite. This is one of my favorite images. And I grew up with this image of my aunts and my mothers wearing those, you know, Cuban heels, you know, that hairstyle, the earrings, and those black, little black dresses. Ignoring the men who commented to them on streets or in church or anywhere. But here, you know, we see Lou Donaldson and this whole aspect. And we know people will say, oh, they're objectifying women and that story. But also they're appreciating this aspect of black beauty. And that's something that we need to recognize. And final question, Tracy. <laughs> There, um, Oakland Public Library has it. I know that Lee's here. You can talk to Lee. There are a number of people here at the museum. They have workshops, and I think that we probably need to promote those more. Um, I, that question comes up often where people want to explore um, this aspect of family and preserving family photographs. Thank you.